Minnesota Original is made possible by the State Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the Citizens of Minnesota. On this edition of Minnesota Original. This is excitement time. Photographer Misha Daniel captures spectacular images of the stage. Her personal story is a winner of the 2009 Minnesota Book Awards. Kao Kalia Yang reads from her memoir, The Late Homecomer. And Paraguayan harpist Nicholas Carter performs Crossing the Isthmus, inspired by his bicycle trip through Central America. excitement time. It's almost ready. Maestro will come in there. I'm going to try to make some pictures of him. This is excitement time. Loosen up the hands. Get ready. When I'm working, I'm not really thinking. I'm feeling the play. I'm photographing the moments that, that don't necessarily spell opera. They spell performance at its best. In English, I would introduce myself. Hello, my name is Michael Daniel. I'm a photographer. In Czech, I'd do it. Dobrý den, já jsem Michal Daniel, fotograf. People call me Misha because that's what I'm called when I'm not in trouble at home. Misha is an endearing uh, way of saying Mike. I think that the reason that I ended up in theater making uh, live entertainment images is because it's so close to real life. I um, wanted to be a photographer ever since I became one in the U.S. Air Force. And uh, after I got out of the Air Force, I was interested in documentary photography, meaning the school of a uh, fraction of a moment and be there. The closest that came to what I wanted to do was photojournalism. But in photojournalism, you also are, in a way, forced to answer questions. And I'm much more interested in asking questions with my work. In theater, the questions that are in, in the image have to do with what does the music sound in an opera? It, what I have to evoke with those images a questioning in the viewer that brings them to the theater and fills the seats. Uh, Ordway uh, in St. Paul for the Minnesota Opera production of Cinderella. Tonight is going to be a tech dress rehearsal, meaning the uh, company is going to run through the opera. There is going to be no audience, and this is my chance to photograph the show for press and for archives and so on and so forth. What sets Misha apart is he's, he's a photographer, but he's also a theater man. He really understands it. And he also has this knack for finding that moment on stage. He will sometimes come up with compositions in his shots that I wouldn't spot sitting in the theater necessarily. And it's because he's running around all the time when he's taking his photos. <laughs> He has an eye for that dramatic shot, and he will do anything to get it. I feel the light, feel the moment, feel the actors, feel the energy. And there are moments that happen where you know that it's just summed up right there. And it's always somewhat scary, and uh, I'm full of trepidation and butterflies in my stomach, just like the performers, because it's live. Whatever they do there is gonna be just like real life. So I'm scared out of my wits. If I, you know, mess up, we don't have publicity. And it's like that every production. One challenge of opera production photography is that it doesn't always look that pretty close up. 
Singers have their mouths gaping open all the time. To capture a really interesting image of somebody singing, you have to have an artist who can see the dramatic moment on stage, but also kind of catch, catch the moments when somebody's not singing. And he's a genius at capturing those moments. I'm originally from Czechoslovakia, now Czech Republic. My father was a filmmaker over there and a teacher at FAMU, the film school. He got an Oscar for a shop on Main Street as a best foreign picture. His work was very interesting because, of course, I was on set with him a number of times. I was in a couple of his movies, and that, that was very interesting. I had a love-hate relationship with movies, which is probably why I'm in theater. It was the uh, doing it over and over again and the pretense of it. In a theater, there is a whole different uh, uh, atmosphere between the, the viewers and the performers. Our responses to their performance is just as important as their performance to us. And I absolutely adore that atmosphere, that, uh, that uh, you can hear a pin drop at times and this massive amount of people are creating this fabulous thing together. I've worked for many theaters, I would say dozens at this point. I started with the Jun Lun uh, Theater, which is now defunct, unfortunately. That was my favorite theater of all times because they took so many chances and they let me do whatever I wanted. If it meant getting on the stage with them, then I got on the stage with them. I was working for the best picture and they knew it. The images that they were creating on stage and the kind of ideas they were bringing to theater were so edgy. Even though they may not have resulted in my all-time favorite images, it is definitely the most fun I ever had making pictures. From that, I landed the job at the Guthrie, and that actually was like a catapult into the world. That was during the uh, era of um, film, so I, I shot a lot of film, and that ended up on the covers of various magazines. What happened then was American Theatre Magazine did an uh, article on the most influential theater photographers in the United States, they listed six people and they put me in that article. Well, at that point, I got a ticket, went to New York, and I landed public theater. And as soon as that happened, then the doors opened. I've been so lucky to work with the greatest people I've ever met and some of the people that are my absolute heroes. Most notably would be Meryl Streep, uh, Mother Courage. I've always loved her work. I had a chance to go into her dressing room and have her approve or disapprove about 40 photos that were picked. And that was a fantastic moment. Of course, I was scared that she was going to hate the pictures and kill them all. But she, of course, kept many images where she's sweaty and doesn't look at all her best and so on, which I was afraid she would kill, even though they are very telling and, and important for the production. The Czechoslovakia in Transition series is very important to me because being originally from Czechoslovakia, I sat here on, in the United States for 22 years looking backwards thinking, well, if it ever were to change, what would happen? Once the wall fell and Czechoslovakia had its Velvet Revolution, I was just dying to go back and photograph it because I felt that the people who live there couldn't possibly photograph it from the same point of view that I have. And so I went back and I wanted to record what was, what would disappear, and, and the first beginnings of the transformation from that communism to capitalism. It's still the um, most cohesive work that I've done in the genre of photojournalism, as it were. In other words, those pictures ask questions a lot less than my other, uh, uh, other photographs do. I am trying to show you what is there. There are, of course, some question pictures in there, but I, I, I wanted to do descriptions. This is what this looks like, this is what that looks like, this is what that looks like. It is really important to me because it is my history. one on this one. It's always a question, is it going to be a two t-shirt day or a three t-shirt day, huh? 
So far, two. It looks like three to me by the time I get finished. The thing about opera is a lot of people think that it's going to be about the fat lady singing. This is a myth. And the best thing that can debunk a myth is an image like Misha can produce that shows that this is a really vibrant, interesting, fascinating, dramatic art form. Shut it down. Take it home. It's going to get busy, busy tonight. The images have to be to the press and on the web for uh, preview articles, review articles, and so on before the audience actually enters the house. So um, I have to give the, the press enough time to have the images, so I have to hustle as fast as I can. I'm going to shoot the second half, but as soon as I'm finished with it, I'm out of here like a bat out of hell. And by then, I have to be packed up with the computer and everything. There isn't going to be any time for that then. It's going to be run to the car, drive home, edit like a maniac. The greatest satisfaction in photography for me, there are actually two moments. The, the moment when I press that shutter button, I think I have it. And then there's a second moment that's very important, and that's during the editing process, where I'm going through the images on the computer, and all of a sudden, this thing pops up. Man, is this amazing. For my grandmother Yuo Li, who never learned how to write, to my baby brother Mike So Hu Ya, who will read the things that she never wrote. My name is Ngokalia Ya, and I'm a writer from the Hmong community, but I'm also discovering that I'm very much a Minnesotan author, and perhaps I'm even, I know I am, an American writer, and I'm contributing to world literature. Before babies are born, they live in the sky where they fly among the clouds. The sky is a happy place, and calling babies down to earth is not an easy thing to do. From the sky, babies can see the course of human lives. This is what the Hmong children of my generation are told by our mothers and fathers, by our grandmothers and grandfathers. They teach us that we have chosen our lives, that the people who we will become, we had inside of us from the beginning, and the people whose worlds we share, whose memories we hold strong inside of us, we have always known. From the sky, I would come again. The book begins in 1975, um, when, the, when the last Air America planes leave the country with a declaration of genocide against the Hmong. Only they, the Hmong didn't know it. And I wasn't born yet, but it is a memoir. And memoirs are not only the memories we hold, but they are the memories passed on to us. And they exist within the frameworks of a bigger world memory. So that's when it begins. Lots of research. Lots of going back to the stories that were told to me, not because I was writing a book, but because everybody wanted to explain why my life was the way it was, why Thanksgiving was Meals on Wheels, and why Christmas was twice her tops. And so I had heard all these stories, and I, it, wouldn't, it would be inaccurate of me to allow the, the story to begin the day I was born. The world that they were living in could no longer hold them safe. It was 1975 in the Vietnam War as the world knew it was over. For the Hmong of Laos, for those who still lived in the mountains of Sinh Quang, for my mother and father, the American shield had been lifted. The communist government that came to power in May of... The Hmong knew that the Americans had left. One day there were American pilots landing planes on the airstrip, tall men with fair skin walking around the village, laughing and buying local food items, giving candy to the small children. And then one day, the planes flew away into the fog of the clouds, passed over the dark green mountaintops, and did not return. At first, they waited. When the murder started, and the last of the men and the boys began disappearing, the Hmong knew that the only thing coming for them was death. My grandma um, promised me she never die, because I was born in a refugee camp, 400 acres, less than a square mile in, in radius, with 40 to 50,000 people. By the time I came along, Grandma was already an old woman with just a single tooth. And she had seen so many grow up and so many change and so many fall down again that she was just happy for this young life to love. Because the Mara knew to what is written, it was with our words that we sought to write into each other. So I heard so much 
So much beautiful language, so many stories. Walking beneath the trees in the compound, my father would say, like the sun is dancing on your skin because it loves you. When the puppies can't open their eyes, he said, it is because your world is so bright. My father used to carry me to the tops of the trees, and he'd hold my hand, and he'd say, he'd say the size of your hand and your feet will not dictate your life journey. One day your feet will walk on the horizons your father has never seen. And he never lied to me, so I believed him. But we came to America. I was six years old, July 27, 1987. We landed at the Minneapolis-St. Paul Airport, and we drove to the McDonough Housing Project, but we drove through downtown St. Paul, and it was a, a highway of dancing lights to St. Paul and then lights extending beyond. And I thought, in a world where you can, where you, like this, you can follow the lights and you'll never get lost. But I got lost in America because we lived in the, in the east side of St. Paul in a 900 square feet home with rotting walls, growing wild with mold. Everybody was always sick. Taylor, my baby sister, had astronomical levels of blood. She couldn't tell the difference between a three and S or a five. And one day I came home and I had never been to a movie theater. So I told my mom and my dad, I, I, I looked at my father in the eye and I told him I hadn't chosen this life that I didn't want it this way. That I didn't want to belong in a world where a kid has to imagine the insides of a movie theater to be normal. And my father said he would choose me all over again if he could. And that a long time ago, I saw him and my mother walking without shoes, and I chose to come down to them. My father said that life would teach me how strong the human heart is, not how weak or how fragile. So I tried again. I tried harder. And I became a, a, a senior at Carleton College, and my grandma said that education was the garden that I cultivated in America, and that one day we would reap the harvest together. But she falls down. My senior year, she falls down. And I go to her and I say, get up, Grandma, get up. And she goes, I can't get up. She says, there were people who loved me before you. Long before you, I had a mom and a dad and brothers and sisters. And somewhere in time, they're waiting for me. It would be selfish of you to hold me back. Because when you look at the map, there is no long land. I'm going to climb the mountain of my heart to the house of my youth. And everybody will say, where have you been? We've been so worried. Why are you so late in coming home? I entered Uncle Ang's house and wiped my feet on the rug, looked up and saw my grandmother in a hospital bed beside the east wall. She looked like she was sleeping. I took off my shoes and I approached the bed slowly. Aunt Chu was sitting by the side of the bed on a chair. A few relatives were on the sofa by the window talking quietly. When I saw that Grandma was not sleeping but struggling for breath, her hair matted with sweat, her lips opening and closing in desperation, her one tooth showing. The image became blurry. I got as close as I could to her. I felt the bed rail against my thigh. I put my head on her chest. I said, Grandma, I am here. I said, Grandma, are you okay? I said, Grandma, I love you. I said, Grandma, don't leave me. I said, Grandma, Kalia is here. I said, Grandma, are you okay? I said, Grandma, I am here. I said the same things over and over and my heart was heavy in my chest and every breath became harder. I made a lot of noise. She raised a tire hand to my head, and she said, Grandma knows. I said, I love you, Grandma. And she said, don't cry, man, I. Grandma knows. She tried to say more things to me, and I tried not to cry, but neither of us could do what we wanted. In all the languages of the earth, in all the richness of words, there is no word, no comparison, no equivalent for my grandmother trying to be strong for me. Her one, man, I. In moments of danger, Hmong people do one of two things. We flee or we fight. And I, and I, I, and I, it occurred to me, no, there's a moment in between. And sometimes that moment stretches for years. And I understand that all of art speaks to each other. All of literature is in the conversation. And so I wanted to speak to that moment of fleeing and fighting, the moment in between, the moment that lives like mine come from. And... And so it becomes um, a story about a young writer in America on the east side of St. Paul trying to garner a voice in a world where she had gone silent. Because when I was seven, we went to Kmart and my mom was looking for light bulbs and she pointed to the ceiling. She says, I'm looking for the thing that makes the world shiny. But she has an accent. So the clerk doesn't really understand. And the clerk walks away. And because Laos is the most heavily bombed nation in the world, 
and my mom and dad grew up in the most heavily bombed province of Laos. Because my father said that when, grown man, when the bombs fell and grown man ran, my mother would walk. I'd always thought she was incredibly brave. But in that Kmart, she didn't know where to look. She, so she looked at her feet. She couldn't look at me. And I decided that if the world didn't need to hear my mother and my father, then surely it didn't need to hear me. So I stopped talking the next day. I've only been speaking for almost two years, the publication of the book, April of 2008. I was a selective mute for most of my life. I never thought that I would um, make my living, because young writers are not paid to write, we're paid to speak. If we're, if we're any good, that I would make my life in words spoken. But I do it. I do it because I know so many people who cannot speak, even when the words are there, like my father, who will not be listened to. So I feel I have a great deal of responsibility and a great deal of work to do. For me, writing is not about the subject, the verb, and the noun. It is a sequencing of meaning, a chase after inspiration, to see whether one word has the power to call in the next. Plus, the work that we do in the moment lives in the moment. No matter what happens tomorrow, the work I do today stands. The song Crossing the Isthmus was inspired by a, a bicycle trip uh, I did in 1987 from San Diego to Panama. And so the song is sort of, you know, the, a memory of being out and rolling and rolling and rolling in the tough hills and the sun burning and the rain falling on me and all those beautiful things of being in the outdoors and traveling at the pace the, what a bicycle can offer.
the song for me, it reminds me of that, of that journey. It was such a strong impact on, on my life, being outside for so long, for so many days, and then being physically challenged every day. Uh, the, you, you're impregnated with the smells and the sounds and the people you see, and, and they, it's a very vivid memory, that journey. Sometimes we'd, we'd camp out. Uh, sometimes uh, I'd find a, a cheap hotel. I, I was kind of like on a, on a $10 a day budget. Sometimes people took us in, into their homes and we found, you know, a barn with rats one night to sleep in. And uh, sometimes it was on a, we bought a hammock in the Yucatan Peninsula and slept on hammocks. And it was unpredictable what would happen. We never knew what the next day would bring. Uh, it was just uh, incredible. Minnesota Original is made possible by the State Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.